Welcome to the Archaeology Studio. Today's episode considers traps in ancient sites. You may be familiar with elaborate and dangerous traps in fictional and fantasy settings of ancient sites, but did they actually exist in real life archaeological sites? I am thankful to Ian Pace for suggesting the topic of this video about traps in ancient sites. Among his many activities, Ian shares imagery from nature and history that could inspire creative works in fantasy settings. Traps could be important parts of those settings. This video aims to clarify how traps functioned in ancient contexts, and how they may or may not have survived through time. The popular portrayals of ancient traps tend to be sensationalized through artistic license, yet people in the past did use diverse traps and other security measures. Traps are among my favorite aspects of fictional and fantasy settings, including everything from simple pits and snares all the way through elaborate mechanisms, cryptic puzzles, and multi-component encounters. In my experience as an archaeologist, though, I have learned that people in reality created different kinds of traps in practical terms. Moreover, only certain parts of those traps have survived through long time scales. In academic archaeology, most of my colleagues would be quick to reject the notion that ancient temples and tombs were equipped with the kinds of elaborate trap systems that we have seen in popular fiction and fantasy settings. Specifically in the cases of ancient Egyptian tombs, the primary protections were the large sizes of the constructed barriers, the numbers of heavy stone slabs that blocked the passageways, and the cultural beliefs about what might happen to a tomb robber. Nonetheless, tomb robbing evidently was popular and even expected to occur, not necessarily right away, but rather after a period of some years later. While most of my colleagues would dismiss the fanciful portrayals of traps in fictional and fantasy settings, I prefer more productively to think about what kinds of traps or other security measures actually did exist. For several thousands of years, people have created traps and snares for capturing animals and for defending their homes. In this case, the only questions are about the actual traps that people created and the likelihood of those traps surviving through long time spans. In my view, I conceptualize traps as forms of security measures. When designing a security system, people generally consider the cost of the security versus the value of the object or the objective that is being protected. In some cases, people may regard a temple or a tomb as invaluable or priceless. Nevertheless, time and money always impose practical limits on what people can manage. Moreover, a place such as a royal tomb may need to be guarded indefinitely for eternity, and therefore the security system likely would involve mechanical devices or traps that could continue to function into the distant future without an intensive human labor force. Very few places are protected full-time by living and alert security guards without any other protective measures. Instead, in most cases, physical devices are installed, and some of those devices could include traps. After deciding to invest in a security system, at least five options are possible. The most effective systems use two or more of these options in combination, and traps could be involved in several ways. Option 1 reduce the public knowledge about the object under protection. If people do not know where a treasure is hidden, or what measures might be protecting it, then they will be unlikely to attempt a robbery. Conceivably, the traditions of mysteries, puzzles, misdirection, or decoys could be understood as traps or as parts of traps. In this sense, the trap is more intellectual than physical, 
deceiving the prospective raider or robber into a wasted effort of searching in the wrong place. Option 2. Increase public perception of the extreme risk or punishment of a robbery. Historically, this approach has been effective in most cases, such as when creating bold inscriptions or other warning signs to deter prospective intruders, warning them of the dreadful fate awaiting them if they choose to ignore the warning signs. Similar warning signs may have involved rock art, carvings in trees, hanging of colorful cloth or noisy chimes or bells, displays of bones, or other symbols that people could recognize within the particular given context of their place and time period. Many of those physical elements have not survived for long, and their cultural meanings have become vague or even entirely lost through time. Option 3. Increase the distance between the point of entry and the place of protection. This option works well even with just a small amount of space. Within whatever space or distance can be managed, any of the other security options could be installed, including misdirection or decoys, warning signs, layers of interference or obstacles, and opportunities for security personnel to respond. Logically, more available space will maximize these possibilities. Option 4. Add layers of interference or obstacles for intruders. This security option relates most directly with popular notions of traps in ancient sites or in fantasy settings. The layers of interference or obstacles ordinarily would include locked doors, barred gates, or heavy stone slabs. Additionally, traps could be installed at any of those points or within any of the passageway spaces between those control points. Importantly, each barrier or obstacle creates an opportunity to stop an intruder, but the rightful residents or occupants of a place should be able to bypass these security measures. They may possess keys to unlock doors or to disable traps. They may be able to use their specific knowledge about their own history, religion, language, and other traditions that can solve puzzles or riddles and thereby circumvent the traps or other security devices. Option 5. Create opportunities for security personnel to respond. In a modern context, video surveillance could record an intruder's face, voice, and actions in great detail while committing a crime, but the individual still could manage to exit the scene of the crime before being caught by security personnel. A more effective approach, therefore, would create alarm signals for the security personnel to be alerted and to arrive at the scene in a timely fashion. These aspects of a security system can be appreciated in medieval castles and other fortifications. Specifically, castles were designed with increased distance between the point of entry and the place of the most sensitive protection as well as with multiple layers of interference or obstacles for intruders. These designs maximize the opportunities for stopping or detaining intruders, sometimes in traps, while the soldiers or guards could respond. Part of the effectiveness of a security system involves the ability of living people to respond at some point. Even when relying on physical or mechanical traps to stop intruders, ultimately, somebody would need to respond to the scene for apprehending or disposing the intruders. Additionally, the traps may need to be maintained, repaired, or resupplied. If the intention is to protect a site in perpetuity, then living soldiers or guards would be impractical or impossible to maintain after some time. The funding could not last forever. Additionally, after a few years or after a few generations, people might no longer be loyal to a long-deceased individual leader or to an older religion of a bygone era. In these cases, traps may need to function on their own, without any long-term human input. If 
traps were designed to last indefinitely into the future, then the designers most likely would work with raw materials that could endure through time. A few other concerns might involve the ability of a trap to reset or restart by itself effectively every time when a person might attempt to intrude. As I indicated earlier in this video, so far no archaeological site has shown the kinds of traps that have been popularized in fictional or fantasy settings of ancient tombs and temples. Rather, the known evidence involves variations of obscuring the public knowledge of a site, creating warning signs or beliefs of dangers for the intruders, increasing the distance from the point of entry to the protected area, and installing standard obstacles along the way, such as heavy stone slabs that block the passageways. Additionally, Sites such as castles were designed for maximizing the ability of security personnel to be activated. I should mention one other popular theme in fantasy settings involving secret societies of protectors who have sworn to guard a site, an artifact, or a piece of special knowledge. If these kinds of secret societies existed, then their secretive nature by definition would have prevented definitive material evidence in the archaeological record and in most historical records. Nevertheless, these notions can work effectively in fictional and fantasy settings. However people in the past made their traps or anything else during ancient times, only the most durable parts of those creations have remained after several decades, centuries, or millennia. Traps made of excavated pits, ropes, nets, or sharpened wood stakes or spears have become undetectable in most ancient sites. People have used these technologies for thousands of years when creating hunting traps and snares. People could have applied these techniques for defending their homes or other sites. And indeed, historical references from ancient Greek, Roman, and medieval periods have mentioned about camouflaged pits, nets, and sharpened stakes. Components of metals likely have become rusted or fragmented after some time. These objects may have retained enough of their shapes still to be identifiable, but they likely would have lost their strength for effective functioning, especially any gears or moving parts of metals would become ineffective after some years of neglect. In most sites, only the raw materials of stonework constructions and large scales of earthwork features have persisted with enough intact condition that still can be observed today. In many cases, these constructions still retain their original functionality. For these reasons, many fictional or fantasy versions of ancient traps involve the use of stone as the primary raw material. In known archaeological sites, the evidence of traps may be disappointing for fictional writers and fantasy designers. Nonetheless, information is available from ancient hunting traps and snares from defensive features in castles, and from the security measures at tombs and temples. I like to think of this evidence in terms of the basic principles of security systems, but other conceptual frameworks could be considered as well. Whatever framework you prefer to use, you could apply this knowledge for understanding traps in real-life archaeological sites. Plus, you could reinterpret or reimagine this information for designing traps in a fictional or fantasy setting. In concluding this episode, I hope that I have encouraged you to think more about traps in ancient sites. This video did not cover every detail, so please add to the discussion with your own thoughts, examples, and suggestions in the comment section of this video. If you liked this video, then please consider to subscribe to this YouTube channel, share with your friends, and explore more online videos with the Archaeology Studio.